Welcome, everybody. This is the Rotary E-Club of Silicon Valley. Every week we are here to bring you something interesting from some corner of the planet. And it is good fun for us to be able to share stories of innovation, entrepreneurship, education, and whatever else we think is cool. Uh, we are Rotarians, members of Rotary International, uh, dedicated to making the world a better place locally, globally, and in all sorts of cool and innovative ways. There are 1.2 almost million Rotarians and 36,000 clubs around the world. And if you're particularly curious about uh, cool asynchronous online clubs, then you've come to the right one. This is the Rotary E-Club of Silicon Valley. And the easy way to find us is rotary.cool. Now, with that, we are excited to bring you a speaker all the way from Hong Kong tonight. Our speaker is Tamsin Nugent. She is the founder and director of Red Tea Multiples. And she has a wonderful story to tell. You uh, read a lot of interesting things on the way in related to the Beijing punk rock scene. Uh, art in, in new forms and possibilities, and we are excited to hear from her. So with that, Tamsin, I hand it over to you. Welcome. Thank you, Rushton. It is a pleasure to be here and to share my rather um, unconventional story with you. I suppose um, it begins, well, it definitely begins in Hong Kong where I was born, but I left when I was 10 and I always wanted to come back east. And so from a very young age, I was always sort of thinking, how, how will I get back to Hong Kong or how will I get back to um, Asia? And so when it came to uh, time to go to university, my dad actually came, up, came to me with this incredible question that I will never forget. He said, you don't have to go to university. You could start a business and I can help you fund it, which was amazing and completely terrified me. But it did cement that I knew I wanted to start a business. And my parents were obviously these sort of adventurous types who really saw in us potentially what we wanted to become, not carving a path for us, but letting us lead, um, you know, lead our own way. So I decided that um, university was gonna take me back East and I didn't want to go to back to Hong Kong because I saw it as sort of China light. I knew it already, it wasn't an adventure, but Beijing would be an adventure. So I studied Chinese, um, Mandarin Chinese at uni and had my whole second year uh, in Beijing at the People's University there. And just like a magnet, I was drawn to the punk rock scene. It was quite close by in proximity. And when I was in these gigs, I, I mean, my teenage years were very, um, I was obsessed with alternative music. I was at gigs as often as I could be growing up in Oxford in the UK. It was a really great gig scene. And so I just, I found this alternative music scene in um, Beijing and spent a lot of time there. Uh, just enjoying the, um, the people around me, they were creatives, they were writers and poets and, and they were dramatic and passionate. And that was, my, that was my crew. And so I decided that after university, I would move straight back to China and try to expose this incredible contemporary culture to the West because the Western notion in certainly in my mind when I asked my friends, um, it was sort of like Kung Fu movies and chicken and cashew nuts and fried noodles. And I thought, no, it's amazing music and passionate people and cool design and, and poems that are crazy. And, and so I moved back and I was going to this event, you can see the poster for it on the right, um, called An Ear to the Ground every month. And I thought I should probably get some real world or you know, real work experience beyond working in a bar. And so went to the organizers of this event and said, I want to get involved. And they said, okay. So I started running this event monthly um, with a guy called Li Jianhua. And together we would just put on these, you know, gigs that were sort of true to what I was interested in. And it got me really involved in the art scene there as in the music and the art scene, because that was the sort of um, people these um, gigs would attract. And then the company that was running those events also decided to welcome the first Swedish jazz festival to um, China and I was working on it. But at one of the, um, the gigs, I met somebody who said, I. Chinese contemporary art's really hot right now. Do you know where I can get any? And I was like, yes, I know loads of artists. And I sold a painting. And selling a painting just made sense to me. That was a business model I could work on. Music was never gonna really go anywhere because everything was bootlegged. You couldn't sell a song in China, but you could sell a painting. And so I had this epiphany of what we were gonna do, emerging arts for everybody, and um, went to Udo Hoffman, who was the founder of the company I was working for and said, I'm ready to start my business. And he said, what about the jazz festival? And I said, um, look, I'd love to, but how about I do it as my business, Red Tea, and you pay me the same? And he said, okay. And so the first event that Red Tea ever did was the first Swedish Jazz Festival in China, which was an amazing way to get started. Um, but a few kind of hurdles later, I 
finally found the what the vision looked like and signed the last available space in Beijing 798 Contemporary Art District and we opened the Red Tea Space, which was a space for emerging artists. And I was very keen on sticking to this emerging area because so many artists didn't have a way to ex get exposure in the market. And also I wanted people to be able to afford it. So we kept our prices low. I didn't want to compete with the with the big other galleries because I couldn't. I was a, a sort of nobody fresh out of university. And um, so my business model was to act as a stepping stone and put a spotlight on the emerging artists and let them rise through us and hopefully then go on to bigger, better, more amazing things with, with other galleries. And I would retain one or a few of their artworks by way of sort of, um, you know, being involved in that success story. Um, so I'd spend a lot of my time in the artist villages, making new friends, finding new artists, and it soon became clear that there is so much amazing artwork out there and there's so much opportunity um, for, for in the market. You know, there are a lot of people looking for artwork that wasn't too expensive and they wanted to get involved. So we started Affordable Art Beijing, which was, um, it, it was an art fair, but actually it was a really big exhibition that Red Tea put on and we invited all the, all the artists that we came across and put and you know I'd hire a huge space to be able to do it the first year we had about 350 artworks and we sold at least 80 percent everything was under 5,000 RMB which is about 500 US dollars and we would just take 10 percent of all sales and so everybody wins um, here you can see three different years we did we, but total we did four and by the fourth year we were at about a thousand artworks and the price point was under 8,000 RMB again under a thousand US then I decided I still wanted my music business. And so we, uh, a guy, Ed Peter, who's in the middle at the bottom picture, he actually got in touch with me and was involved in the London art scene and said, um, I'm really interested in what you're doing. I am looking for an adventure. And I said, come out, let's form a music business. So he did. And um, because he actually knew what he was doing, being a professional in the music industry, he um, he, do, he took us down the route of um, promotions. So we put on all different kinds of gigs. Um, we open our opening nights actually in the top, top left corner and um, Ali B and um, me and Ed are in the middle at the bottom. So that was our opening night. That was the, um, that was, he was, he's a DJ, but we also did true to me, the punk rock gigs and also unplugged sessions and outdoor events. And then um, as Beijing was putting its bells and whistles on and knocking things down and polishing everything up for the Olympics in 2008, somebody walked in the door of my gallery with a notice saying, you've got two weeks to get out, you're gonna be demolished and we're gonna build a car park. Well, they didn't even tell me about the car park. They just said, get out, you've got two weeks. My landlord had just run off with six months rent. And so in a, in a moment of sort of, we need to make this known, I'm angry, but I can't stop it. Let's have a huge party. And I guess, fortunately, our next exhibition was going to be the first graffiti show in Beijing. So I asked these artists, sorry guys, can't put your work on the walls on canvas, come and paint the walls. So they came in at about 11 a.m. and uh, by 2 p.m. I'd invited, well, I told a whole database to come and paint the gallery out of existence. I invited the press. I wanted to make a really big point of what was happening to us, um, but bring a community creative experience to it. And together we made great art in that space. And my final exhibition was the most beautiful rubble in Beijing. And that was really a wonderful kind of closing to that era of, um, of red tea in China. So after that, I was actually fortunate to meet um, Ben Brown, who is uh, a very high-end art uh, gallerist from London. And he wanted to open in Hong Kong because there was a big spotlight on Hong Kong's um, emerging, well, emerging scene for collectors, uh, big tax breaks here for, um, for art, as in there is no tax on art. And so we opened uh, Ben Brown Fine Arts here, uh, a really a, a big a privilege for me to work with him and work with the artists that we brought to Hong Kong. Uh, we did the first commercial Picasso show here and it was, um, it was, it was a really fantastic time and a really wonderful um, extra, uh, I guess, part of the art world to add to my experience. But uh, two years after that, I was in love with a man in Melbourne and got offered a job in Melbourne. So of course I had to take it and was the director of art Melbourne. And four years in Melbourne, me and my husband moved back to Hong Kong uh, because we missed it. And I wanted the fast lane and I knew that there was more that Red Tea could be doing. I wanted to be my own boss again. And I thought it was really good timing. So I started, uh, work, I launched our consultancy back, Red Tea Consultancy, and worked on a few commercial projects. 
And when I was up in Beijing speaking to the artists who were involved in the commercial projects, I realized there's so much gray area. When you're trying to work with an artist and a, a hotel owner and a designer to, to form this you know, beautiful collection of artwork, but to specifications, the gray area, the back and forth, the inefficiencies were all just, uh, in my mind, ridiculous and could be streamlined. So I came up with the idea with the support of my artist friends, you can, you can see some of them there, um, of Red Tea Multiples. And this is a digital platform where we buy art by incredible emerging artists that we, that we feel have great potential. We license this artwork with the artists so that we can offer it on our digital platform for our users to jump straight into that original, crop a section that they like, thereby customizing it immediately. And they can put specific dimensions around that crop. So you can create a completely bespoke work at completely customized uh, sizing for your home or your project. So we have great B to C potential because most of the world buys art that fits and matches. And of course they love it, but they're looking for something to go above their sofa or above their bed. And in the commercial art world, people are looking for art that matches design. So it can now all be done on one platform, but still in limited edition and still promoting the true artists that we believe so much in. And as a sort of nod to the music industry, we, we, uh, there's a royalty on every single print sold that goes back to the artist. And I don't wanna grow my business. Well, sorry, this is, um, this is East Beijing, which is a hotel we did incredibly efficiently. We did one original and then we cropped that into six unique pieces and have filled 336 hotel rooms with, um, with art. And then this was a, a project we did in um, Shanghai. And you can see this long 13 meter wall was actually taken from a crop about 20 by 30 centimeters on the original. And we, could, and we extended it across a 13 meter space, which was awesome. And I don't wanna grow my business unless it's responsible, responsibly. And so I've been looking at ways to um, really bring in uh, upcycled materials and look at where the waste is in the industry. And the hotel industry has a huge amount of um, retired linen from bed sheets and tablecloths. So we've been experimenting with this for a while and working with NGOs in the Philippines to create completely new fabrics like the one you see here and also um, their embroidery techniques like the one top right. Um, that's an embroidered canvas which has huge social impact as well as environmental impact. And then at the bottom, we found a way to print with great integrity here in Hong Kong. So now we have this um, circular economy possible to take retired linen and make it into beautiful artwork to go back into the brand that gave us the linens. And our current project is realizing our 360 plastic, which is in engaging communities to properly dispose of their plastic, which we then in Hong Kong collect and clean and make into pellets, which then go into our robotic print 3D printing. And we can make incredible sculptures out of this recycled plastic that go back into the very communities that collected it, um, reminding them to be conscious plastic consumers and disposers. So that's, I guess, the professional nutshell of um, where I've been and where we're, where we're, where we're going. Um, it's been a pleasure sharing it with you. I'd love to hear any questions that you might have. <laughs> Wonderful, Tamsin. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, before we get into the Q and A, I do want to uh, I do want to interrupt. I do want to interrupt. I am interrupting in order to introduce the people that we have got on the recording. And so, uh, starting in in the upper left for me from the Metropolitan uh, Rotary Club of Eugene, uh, Heather Edwards. Please wave. Thank you. Uh, visiting us from Guatemala is Katie Corson, the founder and director of Sueños. All right. Uh, our, our club's paella master, Stephen Shag Shagrin, so in Walnut Creek. All right. Uh, my name is Rushton Hurley. I am the, the charter president of the Rotary E Club of Silicon Valley and excited to have us talking about something that is truly breaking new ground. Uh, I know Heather has the first question. So, Heather, let's start with you. Thank you, Rushton, and thank you, Tamsin, for, for sharing such an, an unexpected story with us. Even having read the background leading into this, I'm still just overwhelmed. Um, I am an art lover and um, collector, and I am US-based, so I am selfishly wondering what my options are without defeating your upcycling purpose, right? Because, of course, shipping is expensive and has a huge carbon footprint, so what what are your options for global consumers well so at the moment on the platform we only offer paper because it's the most sustainable material i can um 
well, there is without going into, uh, you know, having to print on linens in the States. So if you were to order on the set on the on the platform today, you would receive your print rolled and it would be in paper on paper so that you could go to your local framer or whatever. And so at the moment for international consumers, we're just we're not offering framing and we're just offering paper. But if you wanted many of something, then we would, you know, obviously have a, an individual talk and we could print you know, I think our minimum order for linens at the moment is about 100. And then we would just roll that and ship it to you. A uh, follow up question, if I may, Rushton. What about the sculptures, which uh, look very Scandinavian to me? And I have a, a soft spot for Danish light fixtures and those sculptures. <laughs> very, very. Um, well, I'm so pleased you like them. Um, so that is in motion. We're actually trying to fundraise in Hong Kong. Um, because it, it's a much bigger concept that we're trying to get off the ground here to really educate local communities in plastic consumption because it's a big issue here. And while COVID has cleaned up our beaches a little bit, it hasn't really stopped, um, I guess, uh, irresponsible waste, uh, plastic waste. And so we one, once we have this funding, we have everything else in place to set up our micro factory and start producing the sculpture, which first and foremost will go into back into the communities that have helped collect the plastic. And above that, when the machines have capacity, we'll be creating these smaller collections, which will then go onto our Red Tea platform as a simple e-commerce transaction. So you'd be able to buy it, but then you'd also have to pay for the shipping, whatever that may be. <laughs> Thank you so much. No problem. So Tamsin, I'd, I'd love for you to speak a little bit about how the artists react to the idea. So you're talking about sharing art in, in, a, in a novel way. Uh, and and how did, when you approached them and started describing this, what kind of reactions? How, how, how did people how did people understand what it was you were trying to convey? Well, actually, I, I would say our biggest hurdle at the moment is this education piece because explaining it, there are so many different facets to um, to why this makes so much sense. And when I was speaking to artists, I started with the artist that I was working on um, a commercial project with, and I said, "What if?" We just went into the studio because I was in their studios and I could see what the client wanted in an existing artwork, but they had to sort of paint it fresh. And I said, what if we could just crop that section and print it? And they're like, yes, that would be great. Because certainly these two specific artists were, were toiling to try and get the brief. They were trying to you know, be in the head of the client so that they could paint something that the client goes, yes, that's what I'm talking about. And this was taking one of them about 10 goes, but he's only being paid for one. And so the frustration element was, was very real. And I, and, but I could see that he'd already, already pretty much done what the client wanted in existing works. Mm -hmm. So explaining it like that, it was, very, it was quite easy to get my first two artists on board because they could see immediately that they didn't have to be having all these awkward conversations about um, color and size when you know, artists don't really want you to tell them what color and size to paint. They, they, it's, in, it's in them what they want to get out not for you to get in their head and say, can you do it, you know, can you do the pink, can you do it in pink or that's, that's too bold, you know? It's not really for us to tell them that. So when I explained it to the artists that we could use what they've already got and leverage it so that they could have a sort of um, a passive income from what they've already created and still get these jobs, it, it, it hasn't been a very hard sell to the artists at all. Now, is, is that in part because the artist is bought into the idea that that the person who is consuming the art is bringing something personal to it as well. Uh, you know that that desire to take something and and be and, and and be focused on some portion of it or some adjustment related to color or something like that. I mean, it seemed like there'd be even there'd even been um, like dimensional changes in one of the ones you showed in uh, you know in, in your slide. And and essentially, the artists were like hey, it's awesome to have people take the art and, and to interpret it that way. Or, yeah, you know, I can imagine some, for example, being like, that's not what I painted. Mm. Well, so the 13 meter wall that you're perhaps um, referring to, that is a very, um, nothing's really been distorted or changed. We've just blown it up. Mm -hmm. And because our, um, our graphics and print um, capabilities are, are pretty incredible, there, there is, that, that piece has, full integrity, it's just a lot larger than the original portion. 
in the um, uh, on the original. And so the parameters we put around what is possible and what isn't possible are you can't change color and you can't you can't distort the image. And so we don't have the distortion element. Um, but when it comes to commercial clients wanting very specific things like a 30 meter wall, I think the artist is actually quite relieved that they don't have to paint a 30 meter wall or do any of the um, production that comes with that because they just want to be in their studios painting. So they're kind of grateful that we can take that on uh, you know, and pay them without them having to do anything. So they're getting their royalty payment for it. Um, when it comes to the individual and you know, um, the, I guess a large portion of my friend being able to jump into a work and kind of bespokeify it, make it their own and create something totally unique from an original. This is something that the artists that we work with love. They want to see what, what people are creating out of their creations. And um, a few of them actually have said, tell me anytime somebody makes something, I want to see what they've done, you know, because they, they're actually spreading the love of creativity, inspiring them with their own work. And I, the artists that join our platform are, are excited by this. Um, they are, you know, you, you can say no, but actually to this, to this day, nobody said no. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so when we think about this from the standpoint of efficiency, I'm, I'm, I'm gathering that a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the customers for the art find that this would be a way to get what they want far faster than in traditional methods. I mean, are you seeing that from, uh, from your customers, especially your, your, you know, your larger customers like a hotel or something like that? Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, COVID has actually helped us to, um, to get in front of people because before COVID people are very stuck in their ways. You know, we just, if we need art, we call our art consultants and they do it for, you know, hotel chains, for example, um, or there's a rather uh, a conventional way of doing it. But because COVID has uh, meant that people need to become more, I guess, um, they can't spend as much money. The budgets have been cut, was particularly in, in hospitality. They're looking at alternatives to what maybe they would have done before. And that's given me the opportunity to have these conversations and say, hey, we can do this. We could do your whole property um, by leveraging one or two pieces. And that conversation is now really interesting to people. I'm having it a lot more um, because uh, yes, absolutely. We So that the hotel I showed you in Hong Kong, East, East Hong Kong, we did that in about eight weeks, start to finish. We took the branding um, guidelines from the hotel and we, well, you know, in my, I know a lot of artists, so I selected a few of them and we, we presented them to the client. They chose the one they liked. I spoke with her, it was Rowena Martinique in Melbourne and I spoke with her about how to, you know, what, what we're really looking for. And then she did that commission, but from that one commission, we cropped it into six unique versions and then printed it across 336 hotel rooms. And we did that in eight weeks. And normally a normal, uh, a normal ho uh, hotel art concept would take minimum six to eight months. Wow. So the efficiency play there is huge. And also the savings because mm -hmm. of the time people are spending on this. You know, if you're paying a consultant or a third party for six or eight months, that's a huge, huge outlay. Whereas, you know, in, in eight weeks and we we're only really charging on the artworks, um, it, everybody, everybody was very happy, including the artist. She, she painted one work and got a whole, whole hotel job. <laughs> Fantastic. Heather, yeah. I know you've got another question. Thank you. So this is probably a larger question than you have time for. So I, I'm asking in the, the broadish, broadest brush strokes, how has the political climate affected your your clients and your artists that you work with? Yeah, um, big, well, potentially big question if we wanna get into the politics, which I'm not sure this is the right platform. We can maybe have a, you know, a, an offline call about that. Um, it hasn't in, a, in, um, in the largest sense, actually, because while, of course, we've all got our different um, feelings about what's going on in Hong Kong and China, um, I think this is only really relevant to our Chinese artists. We have artists all over the world, but our Chinese artists are not feeling massively, um, their life hasn't changed very much by the political situation that surrounds them. And so they're getting on with what they're doing. And actually, because China is under such a spotlight from Hong Kong, and it's not really 
slowed down because of COVID, or at least it's kind of, kind of come through COVID um, before many other people, whether it's really through it or not, is um, we'll see. But China is the biggest market for us right now because there's so much going on there. The question is, how involved do we want to get? Because how complicated are things going to become? And that's a sort of um, a prediction in terms of how I, how I develop our strategy. Of course, at this point, because so much of the rest of the world is, is um, I guess, slower and less, less positive in terms of um, where, where they're headed at the moment, given COVID. Uh, China is the obvious place for us to be looking and embracing. I speak Mandarin, I know the country. I can't just ignore that because of, um, you know, where our own opinions sit in terms of politics. But um, what, what that will mean in a few years is, is unknown. I mean, we talk daily about what where our future needs to be. Is it still going to be in Hong Kong? What's happening to education for children here? All these things. I think it's a much more personal conversation than the reality of what's how it's affecting our artists, they're getting on with their thing. Whether they have the opportunity to plug into more international um, jobs, of course they do because they're on our international platform. You know, we, we would still find ways of getting them their royalty payment back to them, but they don't have to do anything. We have the work, it's digitized, it's on the platform. They can still very much tap into the international market through what we're offering. And at the moment we have a lot of opportunity in Hong Kong, uh, sorry, in China, and I, and I have people in China so I can actually see see them through whether I can travel there or not. So I guess the answer is it, it, not a huge impact, but actually we'll see what the next two years does in terms of how much we want to play in that space, given you know what opportunities are in the rest of the world. Thank you. So one last question before we finish up. Um, when, when you look at, at things that are in the news about art. Uh, and so, you know, we, we've seen things about, you know, non-fungible tokens and, and you know, cryptocurrencies. And, and it, is, there some, is there some intersection between how people are, are bringing innovation to payments to how this works with regard to your business? Is, the, is, that, is there overlap there or is that just, uh, just kind of a different thing? Well, I feel like there has to be overlap because it would be foolish to um, to ignore these uh, next steps and innovations. I don't think we're going to be able to exist in parallel. I think we'll become either the dinosaurs or the, or the futurists. And I'm interested in being a futurist. And I'm also quite interested in the crypto space. And I think the NFT explosion has been nothing but exciting. I think it is overblown. And actually, if you go on to um, any of the uh, digital art platforms to buy NFTs, I would still say 90% of it is not something I would consider um, any way, by any way intellectual art. I mean, some of it's pretty, but there's only one thing I've seen that I wanted to buy and it was way too expensive already. So, um, but in terms of what this offers uh, platforms like mine, I'm trying to figure that out in terms of strategy because I want to include it in our, in our development. And my, my um, approach to it for what we do is to be able to offer NFTs of the multiples that are created. Because I do believe that the digital art market is actually an, another market. It's much bigger than the conventional art market. You, add, you put them together and you have a bigger beast. Otherwise you've got kind of two separate players. And I want to be part of the, the whole industry. And so I want to start offering NFTs for multiples, but the retail applications are not actually mature enough to be able to just add an API on the back end of our website. So we kind of are looking at either alternatives or doing this manually for a few key clients, but is there really the market there if we start offering this? So it's all a bit of a conversation that I'm playing with in terms of strategy at the moment. Um, but yes, it is absolutely something we will be onboarding um, when we know exactly what our best um, what it what it will look like for for the best method for us all right well i i, I know there's going to be several questions we'll we'll ask as we finish up uh, following the recording but for those of you who have been watching this i hope you have gotten some cool ideas from uh, new approaches to thinking about art and uh, and sharing art and, and supporting artists and and we hope that you will support our little club by letting us know you are here a little farther down the page you're going to see a place where you can put your email address and your name, and it, it's just good for us to know who shows up. Uh, and if you are a visiting Rotarian and you're looking for a, uh, an email that will let your club secretary know that you've done a makeup, you can certainly do so by successfully putting in your email address. A little farther down the page, you'll get to the discuss section, D-I-S-Q-U-S. That is our forum. 
And that is where our members and guests share ideas about the program and the other elements of the meeting each and every week. We hope that you will engage in ideas there. It is one of the ways that uh, we enjoy uh, connecting with, uh, with, with each other and with our guests. As we do every week, we like to hand it back to our speaker for the final word. So Tamsin, I hand it back to you. Well, I suppose what I've learned is that um, the journey of an entrepreneur is never really the secure one, the stable one. And there are many times where I've sort of felt a bit not sensible or foolish for taking this path, especially when, you know, COVID rocks you and you just think, why don't I have security, etc. But actually, if we didn't follow our heart and our passion and take these le least trodden paths or forge ahead, we wouldn't have the awesome stories and the bright future that I believe we do. So I think it's worth it. Excellent. Everyone, thank you for joining us and we will see you next week.